breath here. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with, every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold-limbed hills of the West. We will rise from the windswept Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rim cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. In every known nook of our nation and every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Thanks again to Amanda Gorman for her continuing inspiration to all of us. Hi, Sophia. Hi, Joe. Hello. Julie, Look, I opened my eyes and there's like five more people on. <laughs> yeah, awesome. It's magic. Um, and Christy's not on, is she? <laughs> well, we'll see if Christy comes. Maybe I'll need to send her a little uh, reminder. So let's start with uh, Leslie. She's moving up the food chain here. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and I might at some point have to step out to go be part of lunch announcements, but I think I'm good for right now. Well, we can um, move you around if you need. No, 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 now is actually good. Now is okay. actually great. Um, and then there is a thing at one that I'm supposed to jump onto too. So anyway, things are Keep going along you. at Trinity Center. Um, in our day center, we're averaging 60 to 70 people per day. Um, they're not necessarily hanging around all day long, but we're still seeing the same numbers, we will, including the significant number of new arrivals, um, new people coming and starting to use our services. Um, Sometimes it's as many as five or six per day. Um, we are doing our core services and some of the niceties, the enhancements we've been able to add back in despite COVID are having an MFT intern who's been really great at working with some members about their, you know, their longstanding um, needs. We can do virtual appointments now with John Muir Health and um, Healthcare <clears throat> for the Homeless is back on site monthly now. Um, and we've re-upped our writer's workshop, which is a wonderful partnership with the Center for Community Arts. So all of those are, you know, to offer services that recognize the, the wholeness of our members and the totality of their well-being, including, this is kind of cool, one of the people who's upstairs in St. Paul's Commons Apartments um, is working with one of our member advocates to offer a weekly um, kind of reflection space. It's not Bible study, it's just like talking about God, talking about spirituality, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's getting off to a nice start, although the weather hasn't been cooperative, but um, I'm glad we're able to offer all of those ways to address our members' wellness in its totality. Young adult program's going great. Um, John is working with the community colleges. We've got a connection with the Rainbow Center. Hope Solutions is our partner in housing navigation and he's got a caseload, um, and one of whom he's super excited, just got a job last week. So it's those victories every day, <laughs> thank you, um, that, that help get us through the yucky times, because there are those two. Um, and we're developing our SUD programming as well. This is something we're really excited about, not just to provide the services and support on site, but to be able to have a, a long-term community-based set of services so that people can be continuously supported in their recovery without having to always be here. Uh, uh, Leslie, can I interrupt you and, and tell me what that acronym was, please? Oh, SUD, Substance Use Disorders. Thank you. Yep, uh, COVID-19, everything is, well, it's the same. Uh, I'm looking out right now and I can see there's somebody I need to ask to, to go please put his mask up over his nose, but um, generally <laughs> people are being cool about it. Um, and our newest toy is touchless hand sanitizers. Believe it or not, this is crazy. We ordered them as soon as we possibly could, like way back in March, right? Um, and it's taken all this time for the backlog of orders to be processed. So we finally have touchless hand sanitizers instead of the kind that you have to push the pump. We're super excited about that. Do they have refills? <laughs> uh, yes, but I don't know how to refill them. I used to know how to refill the pump ones. But I don't know about these touchless no, another ones. Another training session, okay. Exactly, exactly. 
Um, so, you know, we're hanging in there with COVID and everything. Uh, most of our staff who have wanted to have gotten vaccinated and we're really looking forward to when members can too. Some can because of their age or health status, um, but it's a little uh, random so far. So we're looking forward to the big do everybody at once kind of thing. Uh, evening program is going along. We opened January 11th. And then right after that, the National Guard needed the armory back. Um, so we were able to place the people who had been using the armory in some very short term hotel stays that worked out fabulously. Uh, we were able to still provide all the services that they were entitled to, um, just not at the armory. So we were psyched about that. We're Can still you processing tell people it. where the armory, uh, folk, where the uh, National Guard went? Uh, most of them went to Sacramento apparently. Oh, I thought you'd said earlier they went to D.C. or something. Okay. Uh, no, we weren't sure. I think most went to Sacramento. And actually, you know, when it was like, we're coming back to the armory, has anybody at the armory been exposed to COVID? Um, and, and we were reassured that no, and that they no. are watching out okay. for that yeah. too. So, um, so far, so good on that front as well. <clears throat> uh, we're still hoping to bring new people into the evening program because we do still have some capacity. And as part of the public... Um, public stakeholder process. We have uh, every other month public meetings. And the first one was linked up with the Walnut Creek Homeless Task Force meeting. There were no negative concerns raised because there's no reason for there to be negative concerns. Everything is really going quite smoothly. Um, and then finally, just uh, 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 looking forward to fun things ahead. Our gala, our next, which will be our second online gala, is now scheduled for June 11th. So um, if that sounds like something up your alley, please put, put it in your calendars and plan to join us for a lot of fun on June 11th. And that's my report. And that's a free registration, right? Uh, probably. Prob oh. Probably. Generally, I think so, yeah. <laughs> that's what it was last time. I'm just you know yeah. pumping it up yeah 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 oh, it's going to be fun it's, it's going to be a lot of fun was, yeah it was fun last year you have the same um announcer type guy yes same guy exactly yeah, he, the same guy awesome. yes yes he's got a ton of energy huh <laughs> so. there is Ursa oh there's Ursa oh geez <laughs> welcome 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 thank we, you we will stop and introduce ourselves since you've joined us I'm oh, the, well, thank you. I'm, I apologize. I've been sending emergency texts and emails. I couldn't find it anywhere in uh -oh. my, the link, you know. Well, sorry we were so hard to find. Uh, no, it's my fault. Don't okay. worry. Okay. Well, I'm Jan Warren, and I'm the chair of the... Uh, this, uh, oh, Mobile hi, State Jan. Steering, uh, housing and Steering. Uh, Hector, you want to share who you are? Hey folks, uh, Hector Malvido, uh, Policy Advocacy and Communication Manager with the Ensuring Opportunity Campaign. Yes. Okay, Doug, try and speak up. <laughs> Doug Leach, I'm with Danville Congregational Church and I'm the Steering Committee Chair for Multi-Faith Action Coalition. Great. Leslie? I am Leslie Gleason. I'm with Trinity Center. I'm the Executive Director. Great. Oh, great. <laughs> Clara? Hi, I'm Clara Fuchsuber. I'm the program manager for Home Match Contra Costa County. Joe? Um, Joe Kerner, a volunteer or grant writer for Winter Nights. And Joe, I know you from the past, our actions. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you do. I always got to make connections. Christoph? Uh oh, he's muted. He's eating Mark's chocolate <laughs> cookies or something. All right, we'll come back to you, Sophia. <laughs> oh, she's over there, Julie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julie Clemens, the Director of Development at Shelter Inc. Oh, great. Victoria. Mm -hmm. Good morning, I'm an Operations Specialist and um, Development Associate here at Hope Solutions. Bonnie. Hi there, I'm Ronnie Boyd and I'm the Community Faith and Justice Organizer with East Bay Housing Organizations. Dolores? I'm Dolores Loeb from Concord United Methodist and uh, I report on the Naval Weapons Station. Joan? I'm Joan Liston. I'm a member here of uh, St. Uh, here, we're no longer here, we're, we're there. 
Uh, <laughs> I'm a member of St. Perpetua uh, Church in Lafayette and also a member of the uh, program committee of um, CCEB, Catholic Charities of the East Bay. Christoph, are you back? Can you unmute? I'm back. I'm here. Can you not see me? Oh, I no. see you. I'm trying to see if Christoph is back. Uh, sorry, I've got some last minute Hi, stuff I've got to get done. Christoph, now a pastoral associate at St. Perpetua's. Yeah, uh, I, we're I, all I, friends also. Hi, yeah, Christoph. Okay, you got a good friend group. And Sophia has stepped away. She's also with the East Bay Housing Organization. Okay. Great. Well, welcome and happy to have you here today. Thank you. Uh, and I don't know where Jamie Jeanette is, but I know there's a lot of things hopping at the H3. So is we'll Elizabeth see. Robinson not there? She, her son came up to visit her. So she's having a, a daughter, I mean, a mother, daughter, a mother, okay. son, fun day. Okay. <laughs> Can't All talk right. anymore. Um, let's see here. Ronnie. I'm sorry, Julie. Yeah, there you go. Are you looking for a report now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I have nothing to report. <laughs> we are so inundated with rental assistance applications. It's the primary focus right now, of course. Hundreds of people applying every day. And municipalities kind of changing what they're willing to fund on an ongoing basis. Really? So now we're just dealing with essentially back rent. They are, they've really focused the CDBG, CDBG dollars on um, people who have not met the 25% minimum criteria to stay housed. Um, and so um, we have found other resources to help most people with something. It may not be as much um, through some of our more flexible dollars uh, to help folks out, but it, a lot of people who, who have applied have met the 25% and therefore they're not eligible for these CDB the CDBG dollars. So the flexible dollars are going to those who need additional help? Yeah, but it's, it, it's not the same kind size of awards um, that CARES Act yeah. can handle. Right. So, um, and that's just because that's how all the municipalities have wanted that money spent. Is to really, I thought they had pretty much, oh, okay. To keep them in housing. So um, we're looking yeah. at some different marketing techniques right now to, to get those people who maybe are on the edge of eviction um, to apply. And um, of course, um, Hector is going to report on the, extension of the moratorium. So um, he had some great resources he sent out today. Thank you for that, Hector. Um, yeah, put all the great resources in our chat. <laughs> if, if, if there is some. <laughs> so really that's, uh, you know, where so much of our focus is going right now. Are you getting many calls for people needing help with um, the lawyer piece or the, or the yeah, you know, the Please. Yeah, it, it, we've been trying to, uh, well, we have been referring them to Centro de la Raza um, for those services. And um, we're looking at partnering with them and one more organization to do some cross uh, promotional efforts so that the three programs talk to each other. Sorry, I'm drawing a mind blank right now. Um, um, but that's that's really where most of the assistance is being required. I mean, requested, of course. Um, and it takes a while. And it takes a while to get the materials from the landlords then and it, to to validate the claim. So they've taken so, rent off. They've taken utilities off. Um, all the municipalities. So we're not able to do that as much. Yeah, because I was reading something about the water, you know, I'm, you know, we're more familiar with electricity and that sort of thing, but, uh, you know, we need to have our water running too. Yes, but some programs and, like um, in Pittsburgh, they have very different 
Pittsburgh is much more generous and they're willing to pay more. So the Pittsburgh folks okay. we're trying to get to still, you know, keep applying. It's been somewhat, um, I think, disheartening for people who haven't gotten the kind of assistance that they hoped all this money would mean to them, you know. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of money, but <laughs> there's a lot of people needing help. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And well, it sounds like a paper nightmare to try and keep up with who got what to be applied where. And it's a digital they get the documentation, you know. Yes, it is. And it's all digital. And so getting all those materials filed and put in the right place and making sure they're not double dipping with other programs. It is it is um, very labor intensive. Wow. Yeah. 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 Any more questions for Julie? Hector? Hey, Julie. Um, I think uh, as well, I guess this is kind of a general announcement. Uh, I, I, I heard that RCF Connects, I think, is planning on working with MUD uh, and like the Rap Richmond Rapid Response Fund to uh, get something to help people with water bills specifically. Okay. Because um, I think you can be evicted for not having your water bill paid after a long period of time. At least that's what the, the issue that the reason why this fund was kickstarted. I don't have much more information than that. I don't know if it's countywide. I don't know if it's for the city of Richmond. But as soon as I find out, I can um, send that information over to you, Jan. Um, but I, well, another something that I wanted to actually ask you directly about was um, this 25% that you know tenants are coming to you with. You, you mentioned that a lot of them do have that 25%, and you know they don't qualify. Um, when they come to you with that, with do they have the knowledge that they've saved 25% of what they owe? Or is that something that is just calculated after they consult with you and like you ask them, you know, how much do you have saved? Like, how does, I guess, how do we, how, are, how is the assessment that they're if ready? If they've to already paid that 25%, um, then they're not qualifying for this CARES Act money because the local municipalities, each of the cities and the county wanted to make sure that people met that minimum standard to be right. able to remain housed. Mm -hmm. So, um, and every week there are conversations and conference calls that change those criteria. Mm -hmm. it's, it is a moving target. It's been very difficult to hit. <laughs> um, and so that's where our unrestricted extra dollars that don't have those same restrictions on them have come into play to right. help people where we can. But we've had people apply for all, all around the place too, way outside of Contra <clears throat> So um, um, it's been a challenge for people to mm -hmm. understand what we can and can't do. Okay. It's hard to take the no, right? It's, it's hard to hear, no, we can't help you. Absolutely. And when folks, when you say like some of them have paid their 25%, is it knowing that, was, was it with the previous knowledge that their protections would end on January 31st? That's what uh, everybody's been operating under, yes. Right, yes. okay. It's that January 21st deadline. So that also created a lot more anxiety. So now that it's been extended at least through June, um, we have an opportunity to continue talking with the municipalities also about freeing that up a little more. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it'd be terrible to hear. Well, I'm sorry, you already pay, so we that we don't have yeah. the money and you still and then, owe seven thousand five hundred dollars. You wait and then you call back and I'm sorry, we're out of money for that. Now it's like, oh gosh. Yeah, it's tough. It's really hard. And I feel for people. It's it's not easy to wait. Julie, this is yeah. Joe Kerner. Um, I'm new to the 25% <laughs> thing, um, but um, who, is, who is making that rule? Is that federal government? Is that HUD? Is that, who is it? The CDBG locally? It's so each of the municipalities gets their own. So each city, that's what I was saying, like Pittsburgh is much more flexible. But all of the other cities, Antioch, Concord, um, Walnut Creek, um, who am I missing? Richmond. Uh, the, the county. County, yeah. The county 
they all want people to, they want those dollars to be spent to help people meet that 25% minimum rent so that they're covered and can't be evicted because of not paying that 25%. Those CDBG dollars? Yes. Yeah, okay, all right, CDBG grants, I know that. that. 25% <laughs> minimum rent is a state law requirement. Right, and that, that's what I thought Joe's, re, Joe's question was, who's requiring the 25 and it's, it's state oh, law. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, either one. Yeah, both of them. But, That's thank you. But those <laughs> municipalities could say you could give people up to 50% of their rent. But each of those municipalities who got the CDBG funds and then awarded the us them to us to give out have put that limitation on them. They've all said 25% because we want to help the most people oh, stay yeah. out. That makes sense. Yeah. If, if life were logical. <laughs> so, the, so the state law is that uh, in order to qualify for federal assistance, you have to have paid 25% of the rent over a certain period. Um, that doesn't limit anybody from, uh, from um, helping people out more than that if, if, the, if their funds are available. But this is just a qualification for federal assistance, 25% minimum. Yeah, and the timing all has to be just right in sync, you know, and it takes time to make those things happen. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Julie. And thank you for all the work Shelter Inc. is doing. Um, That's a very important role that Shelter Inc. has stepped yeah, up. Yeah, at least, in, at least you're one the group they can go to instead of it, some here, some here, you know. Julie, is there some kind of advocacy that we could, could be applied to that situation? Um, Maybe you and I could have that conversation offline. Meeting at the local cities? Soja. I, and Interfaith I, Council. I would have to defer to Andrea, who came and spoke to this group last week and talked to her about that before I would say we would want to start doing that because we don't want to no, yeah, of course. throw the hornet's nest. <laughs> Just a well. thought. Yeah, no, I, I and I, I once I talk to her, I'll bring that back to this group because we do have a few more months and still money to give to, to a war. Christoph, I realized I took your job. I'm sorry. You want, you want to finish up? <laughs> You're muted. And <laughs> yeah, no, it's all right. I, I, I have all kinds of stuff hitting me at the same time. Okay, all right. Go ahead, I will uh, I will just participate as an observer, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Ronnie. Hey everybody. Um, so EBHO's Faith and Justice Committee has an event coming up next week um, it's called Housing as a Faith Principle, where there will be a panel discussion with three fe featured speakers exploring why people of faith organize around housing ju justice. And the speakers will speak to their own experiences do, do, doing the work as well. Um, and I'm happy to share um, who our speakers are. Some are familiar. Um, we have Leslie Gleason, who's the Executive Director of Trinity Center. Then we have Minister Demetrius Burnett, who's an Associate Minister at Allen Temple Baptist Church. And he also works for the San Francisco Foundation. And then we have our very own um, Sophia DeWitt, who is the program director at EPO and an ordained minister um, in the United Church of Christ. So it's open to all and people of faith and faith leaders are especially encouraged to, to, to join us for the con con conversation. There'll be- Is there a flyer or, or anything, Ronnie? Yeah, can I can drop the RSVP in the chat. Um, yeah, I can drop a link to the event page on 
Okay, yeah, the that'd web, be great. Website, and you can RSVP through the web, website. Okay, thank you. And what's the date of that, Ronnie? Oh, it's February 18th. It's a Thursday. It starts at 6 p.m. You know, I'm doing a lot of Zoom meetings at dinner time. <laughs> That's the what, the life we're in, right? That's they're not my favorite either, but you know, I, I know I for a good cause. I know, I know. I I just <laughs> I try and at least get dinner made, but I don't. Uh, you know, we haven't eaten together as much as we used to. <laughs> okay, anything else, Ronnie? That's all. Thank you, hon. All righty, who's down on the list? We have Victoria. Hope Solutions. Hi, good morning. Give us hope. Um, for our update, we don't have too much of a different update from the last meeting that we have. Um, right now, we are about more than half of our staff has received the first dose of the vaccination, which is awesome. So we're just trying to streamline everybody and continue to, to, to keep track of that with our staff and make sure everybody is able to make their first dose appointment, follow up with their second. So that's kind of been our focus for COVID. Um, and we continue to educate our clients at home through Zoom, sharing resources and links to seminars and webinars and videos and articles and just trying to continue that education um, throughout Hope Solutions with not only our staff, but also our clients and our families. Um, and we're really focused on right now, we have our annual gala coming up, our Ruby Slippers, There's No Place Like Home annual gala will be virtually. Uh, this is our first virtual event and will probably be our only one of this magnitude for this year. Um, and that is happening on the 27th. So right now we are all systems go for this event. Um, we still have opportunity to participate. Registration is free for everyone. Um, and we're also conducting a art and poetry community project, which was focused this for our youth. Uh, we really wanted to include them. We've been including them in as much as we can since the shelter in place. So we know it's really hard for everyone, but particularly the youth. Um, so we kind of came up with this community project that we are extending um, to everyone to participate and submissions are due on the 12th for that. Um, and I have a link that I can share in the chat as well, but basically it's it's an art and poetry project answering the question, how do you know your home? So we're kind of getting the kids involved and the youth programs involved in that. Um, like I said, submissions for that project is due on the 12th and our event will be happening on the 27th. So we are Ruby Slippers dialed in right now. And that's about it for us. Back. Any questions for Victoria? So are y'all rolling along pretty well with everyone getting food uh, that's, uh, that they need at your, in your extended organization? We used to talk about it a lot. I just want to make sure everybody was still getting food de delivered or all their food needs met. Yeah, we are. And we actually partner with um, a few of our um, constituents who have catering businesses as well. So we actually have had um, multiple um, cases where our case managers socially distance and would doorstep and drop off hot foods and, and gift cards and things like that to make sure that everybody is able to get food. Um, unfortunately, it's been hard, I'm, I'm sure, with everybody who's a case manager experiencing this with the transportation um, because they're so used to relying on our case managers to take them to and from places, and we haven't been able to do that for the safety of our staff. But we have been um, providing food gift cards as well as gas cards as well as transit cards, um, just trying to make sure that everybody can get to and from where they need to go and also have food at home. Great, thanks. Appreciate you being with us today. Hector, ensuring opportunity. 
Hey everyone, give me one second. Let me just pull up my things. Um, Can you speak up a little when you speak, please? Yeah. Or closer to your mic or something. Can you all hear me now? That's better. Yeah. Great. So uh, yeah, so there's there's a lot of things that I think you know have happened since the new year started, and I think since we've all met, uh, the biggest I think for EO or the two biggest have been really the three biggest <laughs> have been uh, the housing um, measure X and also the reimagining public safety uh, sort of work in Contra Costa. Uh, AB 3088, the law that was passed in September, which was the eviction protection for lack of payment of rent um, was extended under SB 91. A lot of the things that were under S, uh, AB 3088 are still present in SB 91, including all of the loopholes and the flaws that exist in it that allow for a lot of evictions to still take place. Um, and the extra sort of piece added to SB 91 outside of the 25% required payments to qualify for protections being extended to July 31st um, is the, this rent relief option. Um, it's known as ERAP or Emergency Rental Assistance Program, and uh, the county, or the state is using federal funds uh, to, you know, do this. And I think there's seventy million dollars coming to Contra Costa. Um, and right now, uh, I guess tomorrow at the Board of Supervisors meeting, they're going to be discussing what is the best approach to uh, using this ERAP. There are a few options to uh, distribute the funds. Uh, two of them are the more interesting ones. Uh, one is that basically the state uh, sort of takes the role of uh, managing the funds uh, and distributes them to, I guess, providers and other folks through their process, through their systems. Uh, the other option is that the county takes ownership of the distribution of the funds and all of, you know, all of that, um, everything that goes with that. Um, I think we're still trying to figure out what the best option is for Contra Costa. Uh, at least some, I know some housing advocates in the Razor Roof Coalition are actually meeting right now to talk about what is the best approach. Um, both have pros and cons, um, but ultimately what we want is this money to get to folks. Um, and the way the rent relief looks is that it gives, it's basically two options. Uh, a landlord can choose to apply uh, to receive rent relief uh, and they would get 80% of their total rent debt that is owed by a tenant paid by the government. The, but if they accept these funds, they have to forgive the remaining 20% of the rent debt. And I believe that's the rent debt accumulated between April 1st, 2020 and March 31st, 2021. So it's a huge amount of time. The issue with this though, is that landlords don't have to actually opt, it's an opt-in program. They don't have to participate and they also don't have to extend this to every tenant. So if they have a quote unquote problem tenant that they don't get along for whatever reason, or you know they don't have to extend that to that tenant and they can extend it to everybody else. Um, if a landlord chooses not to opt into this program, uh, tenants have the option to apply for rent relief, but they would only be receiving 25% of the unpaid rent. Um, and I think this, the idea was that this was to help them reach that 25% of money owed uh, so that they can still receive the eviction protections. Um, so, and in Contra Costa last week, uh, the, the Contra Costa voted, uh, the board supervisors voted to extend its moratorium on rent increases and late fees, and also it's moratorium on some types of eviction. Um, so evictions that are of no fault, meaning the tenant had no issue at all, they can't be evicted for that. Um, for having unauthorized tenants, quote unquote, dwelling in the property if they are immediate family. So folks can have immediate family members if they're not on the lease. Um, and also for lack of payment or rent, which again is covered under SB 91. Uh, some of the evictions that are still allowable uh, in Contra Costa uh, are a public health hazard. Um, so I think uh, that's pretty uh, an, an unusual situation, but if the tenant's property 
is a reason to public, uh, it's a hazard to public health, then that's a reason. Uh, owner move-in is one of the ones they just, the uh, tenant basically, just, the landlord basically just have to prove that they're moving into the property and also removing the rental property from the market altogether. Uh, I'm sure there are other uh, if reasons for eviction, such as the water bill that was mentioned before. Um, and, you know, it was these sort of loopholes that led to 134 evictions in Contra Costa, placing Contra Costa in second place in the state for having the highest evictions in the count in, in the state. First place, I think, is Santa Clara. Uh, over that period, of, over that whole period of time or, or that we've mm -hmm. had or? Um, yeah, I believe so. Recently or? Since COVID started, I think. Since COVID, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are the, that's sort of the update on sort of what's happening with SB 91. I shared a, a live document with Jan and Doug. I think that includes some of explainer of what all of these things are. Um, and also uh, maybe an ongoing list of resources that can be updated and events that have to do with, you know, know your rights, uh, and also like tenant organizing, uh, in Contra Costa. Uh, as well as legal clinics where folks can, you know, have access to getting some of the questions answered that they might have. Um, it's a where did, where did you share it? Let me let me put it in the chat now. Yeah, I don't I don't see anything and, from you in the chat. Mm -hmm. And it has information on there that is subject to change uh, as Contra Costa uh, and you know as we start understanding more of what SB ninety one means for the county. Uh, and the resources also, you know, if there's events coming up on your rights and stuff, this could be a good a tool just to, this isn't supposed to be a front facing document. The way that it was created was so that organizations that are working with direct service folks can quickly copy paste something, create flyers, things like that, and maybe adapt it in their own language. It's all kind of just in one uh, place. So that's, that's, I think, all my updates with SB 91. I don't know if anyone has any questions uh, before I move on to Measure X really quickly. Victor, sure. you know, is it the 2021 Consolidated Appropriations Act money? Is that what SB 91 is funded through? I, I actually don't know who or where SB 91, I, I don't know. I I've had landlords actually contacting us on our rental assistance line looking for who was going to run the Consolidated Appropriations Act. So that's why I'm trying mm -hmm. to connect the dots between the, the questions that are being asked of us, too. Right. Uh, yeah, that's wow. That's interesting that folks are reaching out already. Uh, I'm, right now, I think the state is doing these like webinars and sort of rolling out what's going on to different stakeholders throughout the state, uh, just so that everyone can sort of understand what it is. There's just gonna be like a intent to apply. And like, there's, it's still a process. I, I, I don't remember what the timeline is when this will all be rolling through. My guess is that they're trying to get this done as soon as possible, but we probably won't be seeing any funds until like maybe March or April when it's all sort of like baked into, you know, a system that works. Okay, thank you. Any right. other questions? Uh, Hector, I'd like to ask a question about, you know, um, people who are trying to make things work by bringing in, you know, second tenants uh, off the leash, you know, to try and, and pay their, their rent. Uh, how much of that are you hearing about or uh, are people getting in trouble with their landlords because of it and they're throwing them out or do you hear anything? I, I, I don't, I wouldn't be the best person to ask about that. I don't okay. work with tenants directly, but okay. all I know is that in Contra Costa, you can't be evicted for having immediate family uh, living in your space um, and you're in, in the, in the unit. Uh, and if they help pay the rent, you know, that's, that's another thing as well. But I, I don't, I wouldn't know about folks that are not on the lease that are not immediate family members. Okay. And can you, sorry, can I just clarify, um, sure. Hector, did you say can or cannot have immediate family? I, I believe it's can, cannot, yeah. or the, the city, the, the county, or you're not allowed to be evicted for having immediate family members. 
um, in your unit that are not under the lease or unauthorized. Um, can you just describe what the Raise the Roof Coalition is? And, I mean, who's in it or what they're, you know, just a short <laughs> summary since uh, Christy isn't here for whatever reason today. Sure, and Sophia, please feel free. I, I'm only a, a, a member since May, since I started working with EO, uh, but from my understanding, it's a collection of organizations that work across the county on issues that have to do with housing and evictions, particularly, I think, have been working uh, to keep people housed in, as a COVID response unit and also uh, doing actions like going um, to Santa Clara and other actions, you know, to try to raise awareness of the issue of eviction, um, but also taking the fight and, you know, uh, to the city level, I think in Concord specifically, uh, when it comes to different aspects of housing, like a rent registry, for example. Um, yeah. <clears throat> the coalition, the Raise the Roof Coalition started um, five years ago, um, sponsored by East Bay uh, Alliance for a Sustainable Economy and their uh, faith-rooted arm, the Faith Alliance for a Moral Economy. Um, really focused on, um, as Hector was mentioning, um, tenant rights and tenant protections in Concord, and then um, has broadened um, out um, over the years uh, to working on those similar issues in other parts of the county. Um, and really since COVID has been doing a lot of work on um, you know, eviction moratoria and rental assistance um, throughout uh, Contra Costa County. Um, so that's why I was mentioning to Joe in the chat that um, if you're interested in finding out more and doing more advocacy around the CDBG funds and how they're being distributed in the various cities in Contra Costa, um, you should um, come and uh, check out a Raise the Roof meeting um, because that's where uh, a number of organizations have been doing all of that work around the advocacy to get those local programs and local funds set up and for what they should be used for and coordinating with the Board of Supervisors around um, all of those issues. So, um, and, uh, and that coalition meets um, weekly actually on Wednesday mornings um, at 10. So anyway, yep. Well, thank you both. Uh, yeah, Christy um, would, wanted to explore having more, some sort of more formal uh, association uh, with this group. And so uh, we will continue the conversation. <laughs> and that, yeah, and that would be great, I would say, as a as a active coalition member, I pose in that space, as is uh, EO and and some other groups as well. Um, but um, I'll let Christy talk about that. I'm not yeah. I'm not authorized to to do that, but I think okay. it'd be fantastic. Well, we'll try her again next month, Doug. So while we're talking about raise the roof, a um, couple of things. Um, one one thing is that uh, we, this task force and the steering committee, both did an email vote recently that it was associated with raise the roof. And anytime we do email votes, we really should bring them up and talk about them in the uh, group meeting afterwards so that we get it recorded in the minutes. So there was this question about whether a multi-faith action coalition should support a letter um, that came out of Raise the Roof Coalition uh, that had to do with um, uh, uh, asking for anti-displacement measures in Concord. And uh, just to report out that the task force did vote to recommend to the steering committee that the Multi-Faith Action Coalition sign on to that letter. Uh, and the steering committee also voted uh, to approve that recommendation and uh, we did sign on. I signed on for Multi-Faith Action Coalition, and I'm not sure whether, Jan, did you also sign on uh, yes. for, for the task force? Yes. We don't usually do that. Um, 
you know, have, have task forces sign on to letters if, if the multi faith action me, coalition as, a, as an organization <laughs> signed on. But in this case, um, Alex Worth of EBHO, who was coordinating the sign ons, asked the question would that be okay if we did that? And I said, sure, we can do that. Okay. Uh, anyway, so for the purpose of the minutes, we uh, we did do take this action with, jointly by the task force and the steering committee um, to sign on to that letter. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is this whole question that Christy raised about uh, could, um, would multi-faith action coalition consider joining the Raise the Roof coalition? We've talked about the Raise the Roof Coalition at this task force before on a, number, a couple of occasions and uh, agreed that we, we really um, um, support the, the uh, goals and objectives of the Raise the Roof Coalition, but we haven't uh, made, a, made any um, steps to actually join the Raise the Roof Coalition. And when Christy does come to our meeting and we talk about this, whether we should join, what I would ask is that we think about whether we're committed enough to this organization to actually participate in. It doesn't, it's not just to agree with its goals, but we have to have find some, some person or persons who is actually committed enough to uh, represent the Multi-Faith Action Coalition regularly at Raise the Roof Coalition meetings and, and, and actions that, 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 take, that take. So just to consider when we have this discussion later with, with Christy. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, we were going to discuss it. We weren't going to vote on the same day that we discussed, but at least we've begun to put it out there. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Clara, home match. Real quick, I'm so sorry to cut in front of you, Clara. I just wanted to do one more thing. On oh, I'm sorry, Hector. Go ahead. No, it's all good. Uh, so last week, uh, there was, uh, I guess, a big kerfuffle, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, in terms of the propositions that were presented to the board of supervisors regarding the usage of Measure X and how the funds would be allocated. There was one proposition uh, that was asking for 45% of the funds to be used uh, under the purview of the board of supervisors without going through the community advisory committee. Uh, fortunately, that proposition was widely unpopular and a lot of advocates and also members of the board showed up to uh, including you know Candace Anderson and uh, you know, Diane Burgess to support the usage of 95% of the funds being used that put under the process of the community advisory committee. The other 5% is for a rainy day fund. Um, and so tomorrow, I think it's that there's gonna be a call to action that Mariana is gonna be sharing out and i am be sure to share it with you, Jan and folks here that will be asking for uh, a set of, you know, requests when it comes to developing the, the members of the community advisory committee and what kind of folks should be on that table and what kind of priorities they should have, again, to ensure that these funds are used to meet the community's needs. So that's my, as a political way of describing what happened last week. Very nice, <laughs> Doug. And I have a comment on that too. Uh, so it's important for um, community members who have the needs of our, the most vulnerable members of our communities at heart to be on this uh, committee that's going to be set up, the Community Advisory Committee on the Measure X funds. So we, when the, the call for applications comes out and it's scheduled to come out like the day after it's approved by the, uh, the board, which is, so in other words, it's this, the call for applications is scheduled to come out on Wednesday of this week. When that uh, actually comes out, we're going to be distributing that um, to all the members of task forces in, uh, in Multi-Faith Action Coalition. And we want to encourage everyone who is interested in making sure that the sales tax money is spent as, we, as it has been intended um, to on the people, the most vulnerable in our, our county, that uh, um, you consider uh, applying for this um, this community advisory uh, committee. So that's to come. Stay tuned. All right. Clara. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, so yeah, updates with Home Match. Um, not too much to report. 
we have seen an uptick, uptick recently in calls to both the Contra Costa and Fremont programs in East Bay. Um, we think that this is due to the fact that the vaccine rollout is happening. So uh, people are feeling a little bit more secure that there, there's a timeline to obviously not the end of all this, but there's you know a sense of relief. Um, we also, let's see, we're also um, on track to expand into the city of Oakland by mm -hmm. spring of this year. Um, so we did receive a grant um, to expand into Oakland. Gabriella is spearheading that, which is why I'm here today, because she has a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you and, do too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're both very busy. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's super exciting. If any of you have any um, connections or, um, you know, liaisons in Oakland who would be interested in, uh, you know, helping us spread the word out there, we would love to talk to them. Um, we are currently working with, let me see, I, uh, I, legal Are you going to hire more person. staff or, or? Yeah, so it won't just be Gabby and me eventually. Eventually we'll hire a third person for the East Bay. Um, uh, but for now, um, it's right now Gabby as the director of the East Bay. She's still obviously going to be supporting me here. I am now the manager in Contra Costa County and we're going to hire a third staff, per staff person who will be dealing mainly with Alameda County. Um, yeah, uh, and I think that position is posted on Covia's space. So if you know someone who's looking for a job and is interested in home sharing, please, you know, send them our way. Um, yeah, and so currently we're working with legal assistance for seniors in Oakland. They're the ones who are kind of helping us get our footing. Um, we're also working on um, coming up with a marketing plan for our launch this spring in Oakland. Um, but yeah, everything is, is still in the works. We're still doing matches in all of our other program areas while this is occurring. Um, and yeah, like I said, our program is slowly ramping up. We think as you know, vaccine, this vaccine rollout continues, we'll see more of a participation, especially with the updates that had to do with um, SB 91 and AB 3088. Um, so yeah, um, I, think, I think I covered it all. If you have any questions, you can always email me or Gabby. Arthur, are you familiar with the Home Match program? No, all of this is a big learning thing. Okay, for me. can you give been, can I'll, you give just a couple sentences there on <laughs> Clara on what um, the program is? Sure. Yeah. So, um, Home Match we're a home sharing program. So yeah. what we do is we help um, people who are looking for a room for rent match with home providers who've opened up a room in their home. Um, right. Yeah. So we help anyone over the age of eighteen um, who makes less than. $100,000 a year because that's considered moderate income in the Bay Area. Um, <laughs> really? And mm. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> wild. Um, and um, yeah, they have to work, live, or study in the program area they're applying to. So mm -hmm. for Oakland residents, they have to work, live, or study there in order to participate. Um, and yeah, we, we're a free program. We do the screening process for both parties um, we also do um, mediations and check-ins with our matches to, because for a lot of people, this is their first time sharing a home. So, um, you know, conflict is a natural part of living with anyone. So we, we step in to help if need be. Luckily, most of the time, because we do a lot of work to make sure that our matches are compatible before people move in, um, that doesn't usually happen. Um, and then we also help facilitate signing of what we call a living together agreement, which is the home sharing agreement, a month to month agreement that exists between the home seeker, the person looking for a room and the home provider, the person providing a room. And what's your website or our phone number contact thing? Uh, yeah, can, I, I can put that, put that in the chat, chat for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks. Great, great. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. everyone. Anything else? Uh, no, I think that's okay, it. Okay, great. Uh, Joan, Catholic Church. You're muted. 
Um, the program committee at our last meeting on uh, February 4th uh, discussed uh, the evaluation of the program uh, as it relates to its uh, purpose statement. So we're really digging back to looking overall at the, at the whole structure of the committee. And um, the concern and the discussion was around the fact that a lot of the clients, uh, a large portion of them, um, receive mental health services. Hmm. Um, and uh, because of the development of the committee, there, there's, uh, the process has included what they call chasing grants. In other words, set up according to uh, what money was available. So um, Margaret uh, Peterson, who was the CEO of CCEB, uh, gave a lot of input on this. Um, and uh, brought some information from the Finance and Investment Committee uh, regarding the concern of CCEB uh, relying on these grants. And so um, we're, of course, then looking at the whole structure to see whether we're not um, having the tail wag the dog. Um, and um, more will come, I'm sure. We have a lot of reading to do related to this. Big learning curve, huh? Bringing yeah. it up to date. Sounds great. I think we have a few people on here who know something about chasing grants. <laughs> Any questions for Joan? All right, Doug, I didn't know what to do with you, but I knew you'd want to talk about something. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I, I just put something in there. You can talk about anything you want now. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I would like to change the title of this agenda item okay. to to updates on multi-faith action coalition actions. Okay. Um, only some of which are legislative related. Okay. Uh, the, the first one is on tiny homes. Uh, you, if you remember back in December, we, uh, this task force uh, approved um, the, the, the proposal that came to us from uh, Donna Colombo and um, Cheryl O'Connor uh, to help them promote uh, a tiny homes uh, concept in Contra Costa County. And, um, and so that was approved by the task force, and I think it was in December, and then subsequently yeah. by the steering committee. And if you are on the Multi-Faith Action Coalition email uh, contact list, you should have received an email um, doing exactly that, promoting, promoting the, the um, tiny homes um, concept uh, with a letter from uh, Donna and Cheryl. Um, and, um, and so, uh, by the way, if you didn't receive that or don't remember uh, receiving that, it may well be that you're not on the Multi-Faith Action Coalition's uh, contact list. Uh, just being on the JANS uh, list of contacts for this task force doesn't mean you're on the Multi-Faith Action Coalition's overall list. And if you want to be on that list and receive uh, Multi-Faith Action Coalition uh, emails, um, you should go to the Multi-Faith Action Coalition website and uh, click on the join button and you'll get your email added to that list. I'll put the Multi-Faith Action Coalition's uh, website uh, URL in the chat when I'm finished talking. So, um, uh, I can report that uh, Donna reports that uh, they have had four inquiry, inquiries so far from that uh, oh, email that went out to Multi-Faith Action Coalition people, um, including one uh, that has gone as far as arranging a site visit that Donna and Cheryl will be going to the site and looking over a site of a potential, um, you know, tiny homes installation. Uh, I can't tell you where that is. I have a suspicion where it is, but I'm not going to tell you just based on a suspicion. Um, Jan, did you have a question? No, I'm sorry. I was just going to, I, I, they talked about it just last week and she's gotten one more since we had our homeless task force meeting. So that's great. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, the, the, some, some, so the next couple of updates are on legislation. Um, this task force um, did approve or, or 
recommending to the steering committee that multi-faith action coalition approve um, assembly bills 15 and 16 and the steering committee did approve that and we got that registered only just in the nick of time to observe the legislature changing horses and um, and hopping on SB 91 as the solution for extending the eviction moratorium. So I don't think we were very effective <laughs> in our, our timing. Our problem is that we don't really move fast enough for the for such a fast moving piece of the legislation as this was. But we did we did get our names in there. Um, and we also signed up for the uh, Keeping Families Housed campaign, which is the campaign that uh, um, is associated with that AB 15 and 16. Um, and we thank Hector for bringing that, uh, bo both of those measures and the uh, Keeping Families Housed campaign into our attention. Um, we also had already signed up as supporters of Assembly Bill 71, which is um, a bold, uh, proposed bold solution to homelessness in California with continuing, uh, with a continuing fun funding source. Um, the most recent action is that we did go ahead and uh, join the Bring California Home campaign. No, I'm sorry, it was the other way around. We all had already joined the Bring California campaign prior to uh, the last meeting we had. And mo more recently, we did officially uh, support the AB, AB 71, the associated piece of legislation. Um, and I think that's all I have to report on updates from Multi-Faith Action Coalition. You're sure. <laughs> You can Doug, pop in later. No, no, I'm not sure. I have a question, Doug. Yeah. Um, do you know how folks can get involved with the Bring California uh, Home campaign um, other than, you know, hearing about it or sending a letter of support or whatever? Like, how, how can folks join? Um, I will definitely email you a contact. Uh, if I find it soon enough before this meeting ends, I'll post it in the chat. But if I don't, I'll email you. Um, so the, the, it's actually, I didn't know this. Um, so I, we, we multi-faith action coalition supported campaigns from the same uh, coalition of housing advocacy organizations before. And so I had a contact and when we elect, when we decided to support uh, the Bring California Home campaign, I just emailed the contact, Sharon Rapport of the Corporation for uh, Supportive Housing and told her, we're signing on and she said thank you but uh, then um, we discovered that there is a sign-on form an online sign-on form and once I signed that as well I started receiving emails from the campaign so the original email to the corporation for supportive housing I don't think got us fully signed on okay any questions for Doug he knows a lot of stuff, so here's your chance. <laughs> All right, Winter Nights. Winter Nights met last Monday. They have kicked off their safe parking program at the Church of the Nazarene in Pittsburgh. Uh, they have um, already opened up. They have some folks, and I think they can have up to six to eight cars. They're using all the health uh, protocol. That particular church is not um, open, uh, you know, to, to their, they're not having services and meetings there. So they're able to provide this service. Uh, the winter nights um, group is, is full. The housing is full with four families. Uh, they have uh, a baby. They seem to always have at least a, one baby. Three toddlers, a teen and seven adults. They're all doing well. Um, plug out from Joe uh, at Winter Nights that she talked about watching the GRIP, the Greater Richmond Interfaith Project uh, uh, recording of their annual report. And I went out yesterday and found it. I haven't had time to look at it, but um, 
She uh, highly recommends we spend some time seeing all the wonderful things they're doing in Richmond. And I just want to clarify, I only found out at winter night's meeting why uh, we weren't able to do anything at St. John Vianney in Walnut Creek with the, the parking program because the Catholic diocese um, shut all the Catholics down and for using their buildings. And so they couldn't safely use St. John Vianney. Um, so that, that will come back when it's able to, but uh, so they, they do have some funding, but uh, that's just the way those things roll sometimes. Um, anyway, they're doing, they're doing well. They, it, it took them a lot, a lot of work to get those four families, man. <laughs> and and they, even in the parking lot program, the county has been supportive in terms of making sure people have been tested and they're safe and they need transportation. You know, everybody's being taken care of. It's uh, just been a whole new world this year. Um, any, have, if anyone has any questions, Joe Kerner is here to answer your questions on winter nights. <laughs> They, uh, they're suggesting that, that you, you know anyone who gets any um, extra funds from the government that they have a place in their spreadsheet for them if you want to share any extra bounty. Um, Jan? Yeah. Can I add a couple things? I'm sorry, I was muted there. Um, sure. Yeah, so actually, you know, um, winter nights, even though it can only uh, serve about four, people, four families at a time, um, it, this winter under the COVID restrictions uh, have served um, 23 clients. So that's- No, oh, with your, uh, your uh, keeping up with the families who you were in contact with? Yeah, and then, oh no, and then there's that. So yeah, there's the safe parking program, there's the shelter, um, which is much smaller than it normally is. And then, and, and it's the shelter that's already served um, 23 clients. Oh, really? Yeah. People have come? come People have come and gone. Oh, yeah. I didn't- I don't remember hearing that. Thanks. I don't think we brought that up. I mean, we've been struggling, so to, yeah. you know, keep it all together. And um, then the um, the continuing success program or continued That's success it, yeah. program, which um, reached back over the last couple of uh, years of clients uh, that Wear Nights has served to check and see how they were doing. Um, they were able to uh, help with rent. They were able to help with utilities. They were help, able to help with um, our uh, repairs and just food and clothing and everything else. And it's helped keep people in their homes. Um, and then um, now they're planning on uh, reaching back a few more years to check with former clients. So, and I just also want to give a shout out to Eartha Newsong. Um, Eartha and I have, we were in, acquainted over 20 years ago oh, in a really? So Not yeah. quite, not quite 20, uh, maybe 10 or 15. Um, yeah. All right. I, okay. We'll have stories. <laughs> but I, it's good to see you, Joe. Very good to see you. And you congratulations too. on all you've been doing in the 20, uh, yeah, to use your uh, thing. <laughs> yeah. Where have I been? The big question is, where have I been? But forget it. We're not going there right now. It's where you're <laughs> going to go. It's where you're going to go. Okay. Yeah. Habitat. Uh, they have been, you know, they're in a bit of a lull. I called Karen because she didn't make it last month and she's a, so much going on. But uh, the bill, the, the, you know, family bill there uh, in Pleasant Hill by the BART, it's been delayed till June. They uh, are finishing up their tiny home project, um, San Jose. And the, gosh, what's the name of the other one, people already moved in. So they're kind of in a lull between what they've been doing and what they hope to be doing as COVID moves out and, and all of that. Um, Dolores, what's going on in Concord, hon? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Uh, well, there was supposed to be an LRMA meeting on January 7th, and it got delayed. It got postponed to January 20th. And so when I got on there, it was not the uh, a local reuse authority that was uh, supposed to be uh, talking about restarting the project and looking for a, man, um, a developer. Uh, it was the Navy cleanup group oh, that met yeah. that day. 
And so, but they had lots of stuff. Um, there's still lots of testing that needs to be done. And a lot of the old testing that was done so long ago needs to be updated. Really? So mm -hmm. it will probably be late 2023 or 24 before any property is, re is turned over to the city. Oh, and uh, right now they have, um, they used to put arsenic on the ground to cut the weeds. And so that soaked into the ground. So now they're planting some kind of plant of fern <clears throat> that's supposed to absorb the arsenic. And so they're checking on that to see if it's doing its job. <laughs> and also, uh, in the summer, they're going to start working on 38 acres around the runways because there were so many, almost 14,000 metallic uh, items left on the ground around that. So they're going to clean that up, and I think they have to test that, uh, each one also. You mean where the r runways were when it was a naval station? When it was a naval station, oh. yes. Hmm. And then they're also going to continue being doing chemical testing on the groundwater and uh, soil gas sampling. And they're going to have more meetings in April and July and the 13th of October to give information on how they're doing. And then I have not heard from the reuse authority whether they've started up yet again or not. So I'll have to check on that. They didn't just see. Um, what's the status? Uh, are you aware of any status on the housing that was going to be built by the BART, uh, you know, close to four out there? Uh, yeah, uh, but that's BART's doing that. We, they. Yeah, but has there, I don't live over there so I don't drive over there. Are, are, is anything being done? Are they building any houses? I don't know. Oh, okay. They have a their own developer so I don't know. I'm interested in all things housing. <laughs> and, cool. yeah. and the uh, um, Coast Guard property I think is still being auctioned off so it's not going to be for housing with the Naval Weapons Station. So. Wow okay. Well, gosh, you've probably been through more uh, managers than you can have fingers to name. Uh, thanks for being so little, faithful. Little to show for, it, I think. All righty. Uh, homeless Task Force in Walnut Creek. I think I have something written up here. Let's see. That's kind of nice. Whoops, whoops. Oh, well, great. I have something, but I didn't bring it up, huh? Um, well, that's not good. I'm not gonna, I'll just I'll, I'll add it to a report and send it out with y'all. Um, I wanted to mention um, that, uh, I don't know how many of y'all have ever looked at any of the stuff with FUR. I don't even know what it stands for. Um, how about you, Doug? <laughs> you looked at stuff from SPUR? Can't find my notes again. I'm terrible to all of a sudden. Uh, anyway, they do a lot of policy work uh, and research and all, and they've got a whole lot of good programs. And sometimes I can actually. Who were you, you asking about? Spur. It's initial Spur. They're in Oakland and San Francisco. It's a. I don't it's know anything about it. Oh, okay. I'll have to research that and get it to you. Okay, never mind then. They're having some. If, if Doug doesn't know about it, well then never mind. <laughs> He knows about everything. Does anyone else have anything for the good of the cause? All right. Well, time to say goodbye, get some lunch, enjoy the rest of your day. Appreciate all the good work everyone's doing. Feel free to invite somebody new to our group. We are meeting with, uh, we've met with uh, Grayson and we've met with uh, Rebecca uh, Bauer, Kahan, 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 I can't even pronounce your name right. <laughs> uh, and we're going to be meeting with Jim Frazier and um, we'll be meeting with Steve Glazier. So next time you'll, we'll, we will wrap up 
meeting with all of our, uh, our const uh, and giving them the word about how important affordable housing is to all of us. So we hope we can be ready once they actually give us a good piece of legislation to jump on it. <laughs> That's the plan. Okay. Thanks so much Thanks, for yeah. coming today, Eartha. Yes. I'm yeah. grateful nice to meet everybody. for letting me share. Yeah. Oh, you're Great. welcome. Glad okay. we could connect you and Joe again. Boy. Yeah. <laughs> that was a bonus. Thanks, Jan. <laughs> Thanks, well, everyone. If anybody Bye. wants any of these links here. Yeah, if you could hold on to them, Jan, or anything. I'm going to go get a, grab them real quick for Joan. Great. Thank you. Super. And I'll All send right. you the recording uh, when it's ready. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Christoph. You're welcome. Jan, you, did you get the chat? Yeah, thanks. All righty. Great. Thanks. We're good.